Let me introduce tonight's keynote, Dr. Denny Cortese. Denny Cortese is the Emeritus Chairman and uh, CEO of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, he served the Mayo Clinic for over 40 years, both as physician, as department chair, researcher, and then as its uh, CEO and chairman, both at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and the overall Mayo Clinic organization. Now, like most folks in this room, we all know the Mayo Clinic brand, but I was surprised to learn just how big and how far a reach the Mayo Clinic actually has. The Mayo Clinic has over 50,000 employees, over 3,500 physicians across five states. We know about the Mayo Clinic in Rochester and its hospitals, the Mayo Health System in the surrounding states, as well as the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. So incredible breadth and reach, over $500 million in research every year at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Cortez, a, a native of Philadelphia, uh, trained at Temple and did uh, his internship and residency at the Mayo Clinic and never left. And I think he would describe an incredible 40-year journey. He retired a couple of years ago and took on, in his retirement, some interesting new things. One, he became foundation professor at the Arizona, Arizona State University in the schools of public health, business, and biomedical informatics and engineering, taking on a broad kind of connecting role within that fine institution. He's long, for a long time served at the Institute of Medicine, and he's chaired their evidence-based practice, uh, evidence-based medicine uh, work group, and from that work group will be the, some of the key topics that he describes tonight in creating a learning organization. Uh, to, to round out his career with Cerner, he's also uh, recently joined our, our board in May of 2011. We're delighted to have had him as a client, to have him as an advisor and a mentor to our company, and now to do those same roles more formally in his role on our board. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. A delightful and very important leader within the healthcare world in the United States and around certainly the world at large. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Danny Cortese. Well, there sure is a lot of you here. It's amazing. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. And I think um, uh, today's topic, I'm going to try to make it feel like what is the possible, which is your theme. But to do that, before I start, I'd like you all first to um, put aside what your role is in whatever job you do. Think of yourselves as an individual which you are. Think of yourself as a person, which you are. Think of yourself as a patient, which you may not be, but you likely will be. And think of yourself as pre-op, because as a physician, we look at everybody like they're pre-op. So someday you're going to be banging on the door to get some kind of health care. And the reason I say that is that you need to begin to think about what is important for you in the future and in this century in healthcare. Now let me take you through what I mean by that. And I'm going to ask you three questions. We'll get right to it. And raise your hand if you think you should say yes to these questions. The first question is, who in this room would like to be admitted to a hospital tomorrow, even if it's the best hospital in the world? Anybody raise your hand? Hard to see, I can't quite see the audience. But I don't see too many hands uh, going up. Now, I've asked this question for the last six or seven years at every meeting I've been to, and I've had uh, one hand go up at the National Press Club where somebody sat in the corner and I asked them why they raised their hand and the person was laughing. He said, well, I have to see, I'm going to see my mother-in-law this weekend. <laughs> so, and that actually happened. I was on a televised <laughs> broadcast. It was a little bit, a little awkward to recover from that, but I guess he had a point. I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, you said you prefer not to go to a hospital, right? So then, why are hospitals viewed as the center of the universe in healthcare? 
the use of a hospital could become an indicator of the failure of a healthcare system. Now, we're all going to be sick. We all have to go to a hospital, perhaps, sometime. But maybe not as often as we've done in the past. Maybe not for as long. And not maybe as sick as we've been in the past. But we all can picture a declining need for hospitals. Hospitals should be looked as cost centers. Hospitals may make money, but that isn't the point. The point is that if you run them very well and you deliver care for all of you, you may actually not go to the hospital in the future. Second question is who in this room would actually like to be sick tomorrow? Not too many hands go up for that. I haven't ever had a hand go up for that. So then why are physicians perhaps viewed as the center of the universe for healthcare? Because so far you said you prefer not to go to hospital, you don't want to be sick. So what is it that you really want? Who in this room would actually like to be a patient? Defined in the dictionary as somebody who long suffers and long endures. Who wants that? So we're all going to have illnesses and chronic conditions. I've got five. And when I left Mayo Clinic, I said, I don't want to ever have to come back. And I actually don't even want to have to see any of you. <laughs> what are you going to do to keep me functioning and as healthy as I can be, given my conditions that I have? And I'm not going to change that. That becomes the challenge for, I think, this century. And as I go through my discussion here, picture where your role could fit in to help make the three questions that I just asked you come true, where you answered no to all three of them. So what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how can we create a learning healthcare system in the United States so that we are all learning together collaboratively? How do we work together to make this work? Before I can start, I really need to have a, a moment for you to read this quote because this quote gives you my world view. Now, read the quote. Don't look at the data who said it at the bottom. As we have medicine grow in learning, we more justly appreciate our dependencies on each other. The sum total of medical knowledge is now so great and widespreading that it would be futile for any one person to assume that we have even a working knowledge of any part of the whole. Now, if you look down at the bottom, you've seen that was a quote from 1910 by Will Mayo at the graduating class commencement ceremony of Rush Medical School, 1910, 100 years ago. The second sentence here, the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered, reflects what you just told me in the questions I asked you. Because you're all pre-op and you're all going to be a patient perhaps someday like I am. The last half of that sentence is a powerful message. And in order that the sick may have the benefit of advancing knowledge, a union of forces is necessary. 1910 could hardly do any surgery other than around the abdomen, amputated limbs when they were injured, no treatments of chemotherapy, no antibiotics. Think of the depth of that sentence. It also explains why William Mayo, one of the founders of the Mayo Clinic, hired their first system engineer to design information distribution systems at Mayo Clinic in 1901. And by 1907, he had introduced the unified medical record that we still use today, created the tube system, all the communications activities. Now, the only reason I'm saying this is it gives you a feeling of my mindset, where I'm coming from in the rest of my discussion. So now let's start a little bit and walk our way through what perhaps could be done in today's healthcare system to make it be a functioning system of systems.
How can we communicate with each other? And I'll just give you some con uh, conceptual visualizations of what this potentially could look like in the near future, and it reflects the, the work that some of us have been doing for about eight or nine years now. If we take what is going on in the country today and split it up into maybe three domains, just to make it understandable for you what I'm talking about, because you can probably make four for sure, maybe a fifth domain, but the three are the main drivers. The first domain, if we just look at that little graphic there, the first domain is what I call the knowledge domain. In that domain is where all the basic research is being done. It's where the units of research are residing, maybe in academic centers, maybe in pharmaceutical companies, device manufacturers, etc. The funding for this domain is provided by the federal government predominantly. About $31 billion this year, I think, was finally allocated to fund this kind of work. Uh, and when you look at this at a macro view, now this is just, just look at that as a universe, and we are several thousand light years away and looking at it from a macro view, but just to give you a sense that that is a system right now. From an engineering perspective, we can do a lot to improve that system, but that's not the topic of our talk today. But just to give you a snapshot, if we look at this as a system and we sit back and we look at it and see, is it connected? These little dots that are connected are basically ad hoc connections that have occurred around, let's say, a research project. Perhaps a certain research project, all of a sudden UCLA needs to work with Dartmouth or with uh, Hopkins or Cleveland Clinic, etc. But the key point is there hasn't been any conscious attempt to actually connect all the dots within that research domain or the knowledge domain. There hasn't been a conscious attempt to make them all be able to work together. And from an engineering perspective, you'd have to say to yourself, how much waste is going on in there? How much duplication is there that we're not learning from each other? But I'm not here to spend a lot of time diving into that domain, but you get the idea. If you look at that as a universe, what can be done to improve the interconnectivity within that universe, given the fact that the country has not made a conscious attempt to do it? I, granted, we have made an attempt with CAB. Many of you probably have been involved with that but it hasn't made it to the level that I'm talking about, and you know we can do better in that regard. Now, the next domain is where the patient should reside. The patient should be at the center of the universe of this particular domain, and that domain is basically the uh, care delivery domain. And if you look at that as a universe, and you look carefully in there, you see dots of all different sizes, and that would be uh, uh, let's say nursing providers, home nursing, small groups, individual doctors, uh, specialty groups, large group practices, academic medical centers, integrated group practices that have hospitals and, and clinical uh, practitioners do research. Uh, when you begin to look at that, you then also see individual hospitals, groups of hospitals, national groups of hospitals. You see all kinds of activities going on in, in that universe right now. When you look at that from a distance, you take a step back again and you say, hey, there are some galaxies in there. And those galaxies are connected. They have a degree of connectivity. Now, frankly, there hasn't really been a conscious attempt to connect all the dots within that domain. And actually, I have not really seen it happen in even any country. When I expected to see it really in a, in a big way, in England, for instance, there still isn't that connectivity that can be done. Yes, all the primary care doctor's offices have IT systems, but there isn't, they're not really connected very far. They're not connected to the hospitals, etc. There hasn't been a conscious attempt to make it work. Recently, in the United States, with the, um, the, the, national, the Office of the National Coordinator for Information Technology, there was attempt through meaningful use to move us into this direction of connectivity. But as I've asked David Blumenthal a few times, and that is, what would have happened if we had just one sentence for meaningful use? And the sentence was, we'll pay $40,000 to every physician who puts a unit into their office, provide it, and only if the unit is interoperable with everybody else. What would that have done? I don't know the answer to that. But it would have been a way to maybe dangle 20 to 40 billion dollars to say, let's all start to look how can we connect. Well, the challenge for us 
in the delivery system, which I count all of you in, is to make that interconnectivity real. So we can't wait for the government to do it. We have to do it. And we all can make that happen, as you well know. It's going to take a lot of work, but it is a possibility to create that uh, uh, connectivity. Okay, the next domain is the payer domain. Now in there, you have the small insurance companies. We have employers that are, uh, they self-insure. Those are the big employers. We have small businesses that are trying to buy insurance for people. We have um, uh, large insurance companies and small insurance companies. We have Medicaid in each of our states. So that's about 50 different types of programs there. Each runs a little bit differently. And at the federal level, we have eight insurance products that are available. For instance, we have Medicare, we have Medicaid, we have TRICARE for the military, we have the Federal Employees Health Care Plan for people who are federal employees, which is quite different than Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, it's, more, it's similar to TRICARE. It's actually a massive exchange for all the employees to buy insurance and to buy up with a fixed premium provided by the government, and they can take it wherever they want. So there are lots of different options within that domain. But there's a characteristic in the domain, and that is when you look at it, uh, it basically looks like the Big Bang just occurred yesterday. It's total chaos. We have no understanding for what goes on inside that domain. There is no connectivity. Nobody talks to each other. They don't share the data. And the payment that is made to physicians is made in an environment where it's kept pretty secret. And they don't share much information with the providers of care. So we have three separate domains that if you were to say to yourself, can we make use of those functioning domains, and they're functioning at different degrees of effectiveness and efficiency, but can we turn them into a system of systems? And how do we get them to relate to each other in a better way that will help us create the answers to the questions that you just gave me. Keep that in the back of your mind, that's, or in the front of your mind. That's really the vision we're trying to talk about. So now if we draw a box around this and we say, let's look at this from an engineering perspective and say, how do we make this be a functioning system of systems? Well, one of the system theories would go that is, is that is when you want systems to interact with each other, maybe what you should do is pay attention to the interfaces of where they interact with each other. I want to describe where these interfaces are today because that will, by implication, give you some clues of where we might be able to start. If we look at the two interfaces that we have here, one, uh, the, the one on your left is the, uh, the translation to care, to the care delivery system. Now, that interface has not been attended to in any way to create a learning organization. It's been attended to in a way to try to make sure that the, the stuff that comes out, medications, devices, are safe and effective. But we don't know if they are more effective or less effective, what patients they should be used in. And the upshot of not paying much attention to that interface is we have a whole bunch of stuff that comes out of the knowledge domain all the time. Really good stuff, a lot of innovation, a lot of new discoveries. And the question is, is it good enough? And if it is, for whom? Is it better than what we were doing? How do we know? What's the evidence? We haven't managed this interface in a way to answer any of those questions. Not at the interface. We may learn them over time when we get over to the care delivery domain, but not coming through the interface. We don't actually know where things actually would apply, or does it replace something we're already doing? The result of that, basically, is that over time, some things trickle through into the care domain. And in our studies and looking at this, and others have reported this, but basically, what we can learn from looking at what has happened in the past, the way we've been doing things, is that in about 17 years, Stuff that is of value gets into the care domain and is used appropriately 50% of the time. 
That's what all the literature has demonstrated. What does that mean when you look at it like that? It means if a person has breast cancer and they go to a physician in the, in the care domain, the current performance in the United States is roughly 85% of the time that woman will get the right advice and the right treatment. That's the best performing diagnosis we have in the United States. 85% of the time, we'll get the right advice and the right treatments based on the knowledge that we have, which means 15 out of 100 women will not. Now, if you have atrial fibrillation or high blood pressure and you go into the care domain, you will get the right advice, current state-of-the-art advice about what to be done if you're lucky, 25 to 30 percent of the time. In atrial fibrillation, it actually goes down to 15 percent of the time you will get it. And that's after all these years of knowing what works. How can we improve on that? How do we distribute the knowledge to make that performance better? When we started looking at this at Mayo Clinic, for instance, back in the early 2000s, our best estimate was about two-year time frame within Mayo Clinic. And we made a conscious decision to create what we call Ask Mayo Expert, which is an a, um, information technology-based tool that searches the electronic record and the data sets that we have available to provide reminders to physicians about certain conditions that we have flagged as being at very high risk for patients. Our goal is to have that time frame down to less than a day with the click of a button with the staff that is keeping that functioning. And I've been away from Mayo for not quite two years now. But I don't know if they're there yet, but when I left, we were just about there. We had all the internal medicine diagnosis loaded in and all the information about it in place. Well, that's a way to build a learning system. And it's not protocols, it's not pathways or guidelines, it's the current state of the knowledge with recommendations applied, and it's up to the physician and the patient to decide what they want to do. That's where the art of medicine comes in, where you, once you, the science of medicine is to know what to do. And in our previous performance with 17-year lags, we don't all know what to do. But once at least you know what to do, you work with the patient to decide, well, does this patient really want it? Maybe they have other reasons not to want to take a risky treatment. There may be other reasons which is okay to not accept the standard treatment or the best treatment. It's all right if you decide not to do that. I was a lung cancer physician for many years and have two people from the Midwest. Two farmers would come in. One farmer says, Doc, thanks for telling me. I only have a, a 10 to 15 percent chance to live five years, but I, would any, I want everything you can do for me. That was within reason. Another, doc, another patient would come in and say, Doc, thanks for all the information, but my money is in my land. I don't want to sell the land. I want to, live it to the, leave it to the kids. I've had a great life, and I don't want to take that 10 to 15 percent chance and, and, and spend my possible inheritance for the kids. Now I become a doctor, and I treat this one the best way to keep them comfortable, and the other one, we do it whatever we possibly can do. That is within reason. So the art of medicine is a little different than the science. And the science of medicine is let's get the information and knowledge in front of the people where they need it at the point of decision making. So how can we do that around that interface? And there, I won't go into the details, but there are many ways to move this interface much closer to the left-hand side, get it done quicker and sooner. If we begin to bring technology out and use it early, but the quid pro quo is we're using it under protocols or guidelines or under research studies, however you want to call it, where we're learning as we go. And if we had done this just a few years ago, we would not have uh, pulled Vioxx off the market, for instance. We wouldn't have known who the 5 to 10 or 15 percent of the people that Vioxx actually worked for. I can tell you one organization in the country knew and that was Kaiser. They were already restricting the use of that medicine down to the 5 to 15, 10, 20, 15 percent or so of the patients that it was effective for. Because they can learn from their processes of care. It's the only way they make money. It's their core business. 
Okay, now if we we'll move on from that one and let's look at the other interface. The other interface is actually a fascinating one, and that is the care domain can create many new models of care, different ways of caring for people. And I'll give you an example. 1993, when I was in Jacksonville, we started a process to say, let's look at our sickest Medicare patients who were coming frequently into our primary care office and were also going to the emergency room for conditions that they didn't need to be coming that often if we did a good job. We focused on diabetes and high blood pressure. Those are the, the, the main two. And what we did is we set up, in those days we only had modems, remember the old modems and the slow technology, and we had a little TV screen, it was real small, but we had these devices that we could be monitoring the people in a central location in their retirement communities. We had two retirement communities that we ran this experiment on. We took one room and built two terminals with two nurses who were running it for four hours a day, eight to noon. And our these were our patients, but we were trying to encourage them to stay back, and they would come and make a, they would have an appointment with the nurse practitioner. Our goals were simple. Can we reduce the need for those patients to go to the emergency room? Can we reduce the need that they were being admitted to the hospital? And would we reduce the amount of time they were coming to our primary care offices so we could free up new appointments for other patients coming in by still, and still get the good outcomes, better outcomes, actually? So we ran that experiment for two years. We got two publications out of it, and the patients liked it very much. Well, it was free. We weren't charging. So they liked that very much, and we got the results we were aiming for. As a matter of fact, internally, the biggest objection we got to what we were doing is that the primary care doctors were having fewer recycling of their patients, and they were seeing more new patients, where they liked seeing their old ones coming back. That was our biggest internal complaint, which shouldn't surprise me very much. They liked seeing those folks, but we were, instead of coming once every three weeks, they were coming maybe once a quarter to see the physician or less. And of course, they were not going to the hospitals often or the emergency rooms, because they had instant contact with people that they needed to on a daily basis. And we were proactive about it, because we were trying to manage them in a way that we got better outcomes at lower costs. So after two years of this, two publications, I thought, well, let's go to Medicare and talk to them and offer this as a service. Let's see if we can work it. And we were trying to, we did a lot of work with KPMG to price it. And we were thinking maybe $60 would be appropriate reimbursement. But I was prepared to have Medicare come back and say, well, we'll pay you 18 or 30 or whatever it was. And I thought that was going to be the battle. Went in, described what we were doing, and they said to us, basically, let me get this straight. The patient is not coming to your office. They're not seeing the physician. You're giving advice over this phone with the nurse. Nurse provided care is a non-reimbursable expense by Medicare regulations then, and it's a true statement today. They said, that's fraud. <laughs> and it's still true today. Unless you get some kind of waiver, or you're in some kind of a program that they're trying to create with all these regulations. In 1995, we shut down the program. That's what the diamonds mean on the diagram. Innovative programs that can be done. Can you put the slide back up for me so they can just see what I mean? In innovative new programs or new ways of giving care, new models of care by willing providers that want to produce better outcomes, better safety, better service, and lower costs but it dies because you can't get paid for it. So at that, right at this point, then let me define what I mean by better outcomes, better safety, better service at lower costs. What that is is value in healthcare. It's quality, outcomes, safety, service, divided by the cost over time that you're incurring for the patient. The military uses that equation, and in the numerator they add one other factor, outcome, safety, service, and they add readiness, which means are our active duty military ready, and are they on active duty? Can they fight the war? 
Well, when we've tried this with employers, they say, yeah, we need that in the numerator too. That means people at work. It's productivity. So we can define what value is. The question comes, will anybody pay you for it? And we'll come to that in just a minute. Back to the diagram. We can see then some of the arrows actually get to the interface and some of them get through. And the length of the arrow getting through is the amount we're paid for a given service. Some cases we're paid more than we really would need. Most of the time we're paid less, so everybody's cost shifting. And at the federal government level, they set the prices so you don't get to negotiate at all. States and federal levels, they just set the price. We don't get to negotiate. But the point is that for a given service, we're paid all over the place. For a chest x-ray, it doesn't matter that your charge might be $150 or $300. The amount we're paid is totally separated from what the actual cost of delivering care. What we're paid is what government tells us we're going to get paid and or what we're paid is what we can negotiate. How much discount are we forced to provide to insurers? And that's where all the decisions are made. And that could be fair enough. That's a market-based approach. The saddest part of this whole thing is that at no time for any payment has there ever been a payment made to a provider based on outcomes, safety, service, or the costs incurred? No payment comes out of that system linked to high-value care. No payment comes out of that system to keep you out of the hospital or to keep you healthy. The system pays us fee-for-service which means we make more money the sicker you are. Tremendous disconnect here with looking at this from a systems to system perspective. So, now I've described a little bit of, of what, what a systematic look might look like and feel like. The question comes now, what can we do to make some of this work? And I'll just split it into maybe six, uh, six categories here for this talk. Uh, of areas that we could be concentrating on to try to fine-tune this to get it to work. Uh, and you can look at them as somewhat uh, topics about levers, what levers can be pulled to make this system of systems self-organize. Okay? In our current environment here that you're looking at, one we have now, what I basically described is that we have all self-organized to try to maximize our own little domains here. Like I said, if people will pay us fee-for-service, we'll keep you sick. If they cut the payments that they provide to us, not only will we keep you sick, but we'll do more to you to make up for the reductions in line item payments. So what do we hear in the United States as one of the problems? unexplained variation in utilization rates, length of stay in hospitals, not so much length of stay anymore because of DRGs, but certainly length of stay in ICUs, visits to the emergency room, number of x-rays, etc. Utilization rates are relatively hard to understand. And indeed, some of the places that have the highest utilization rates have also the worst outcomes. Well, the sad part is those places that have the worst outcomes are also getting paid the most amount of money. So when you sit down and you talk to politicians and leaders in the United States and you ask them what is the number one problem in health care in the United States, they pretty well say that it's, we're not getting what we pay for. And I have to say you're exactly right. What, what you would like to get is good outcomes for the amount of money we're spending. What you would like to get is high value care. And I also then go on and point out, well, the sad part is Unfortunately, we are getting exactly what we're paying for because we are not paying for high-value care in this country. So it's the fallacy of doing A but hoping for B. Hope is not a management strategy. It's not going to get you very far. 
can't hope for high value care and pay the most amount of money to the worst providers in the country. Somebody has to step up and change this. I think it's coming in the current bill that was passed. There's the insurance piece and there's how to pay for it, which has some problems. But the other components of it have a fair bit in there that allows HHS and CMS to create new models of care and try new payment models. They have come out with some regulations this year that haven't gotten it done yet. We're at the implementation phase. The bill has already said it's allowable. They've given permission. We're now dealing with regulators that don't understand it. If you've seen the new pay for performance thing they've come out with uh, just recently, it was about a week or so ago, it's the pay for performance is what they are describing. Their technique will be to do value-based purchasing. That's the umbrella, value-based purchasing. And then they say, well, we're going to pay for performance. When you look at it in detail, what it is really saying is we're going to pay for compliance with process, how you do things behind the scenes, regardless of what the outcomes are, regardless of your cost incurred, regardless of how safe it's provided. They're hoping that process will make sure you get better outcomes and better safety and better service. Maybe. There's lots of literature that says, yes, that'll happen, and there's other literature that says, no, it won't. Matter of fact, some pretty powerful literature lately that you cannot take a process from some of you who are working in really good hospitals that probably get great outcomes at low cost, and you have your own internal processes. If you lifted them up and try to put them into one of your own organizations in another state, it may not work. Because the processes, as you all know, are different. They're a function of where we reside. There's a tremendous purpose for process. Don't misunderstand me. I'm a proponent of process. But only if we're measuring outcomes. Not the process. Measure the outcomes. Matter of fact, if you don't measure the outcomes, you'll never have any changes in the processes. All innovation will die. So to really make this work, we have to focus relentlessly on the concept of value in healthcare. Better outcomes, better safety, better service, low cost, which is really what all of us want. I mean, we all belong to a population. Next level down in that population are going to be groups of people who are at risk for conditions. Well, we're never ever going to get to that risk of conditions if we don't deal with the other two. The next one down are those people who already have the conditions and are living with it. They're not, they're not at risk. They've got it. And the last one down is those people who are acutely ill. Our health care system was designed for the bottom one. That's where all the money is being spent. That's where health care delivery is done. If we want to free up money, nobody's going to give us more. We've got to free it up at the bottom. Get better outcomes for those people who are acutely ill, free up cash, start using it to keep people who have chronic conditions healthy and viable. Once we start doing that, you have some cash to start looking at true prevention, prediction and prevention, individualized medicine. So now let's, with that, let's lead into some of the concepts that we might want to consider. The first set over here is, we'll start all the way to the left, is individualized medicine. All of us are different. No one in this room can ever think that even one medication will work for 80% of us anymore. I'll bet you sometime in the near future that one medication may work well for one of us. And each one of us are going to have our own individually tailored, mass customized type of treatment. That may not be right. But we'll all fall into smaller and smaller bins of how to be treated. Look at breast cancer. Depending on how you look at the genomic predictors that exist within just tumor markers, we have probably 125 or more types of breast cancer today. We already use about eight or nine different types of treatments for those different types of markers. So is breast cancer a condition anymore? Or is it a chronic condition with several different opportunities in here on how to treat people? Well, if we don't focus on that set of concepts, we're going to miss the opportunity of this century to focus on what's best for the individual. The additional concept here is the individualized medicine is the basic research component, but it is also 
the idea of focusing on the individual and what is best for them. If we're trying to manage this individual's condition, maybe the active ingredient is insulin, and maybe the problem is the social circumstances in which they are living. So we can sit back and try to hammer them on the head and use your insulin right and look at your diet and everything else when the heart of the problem is individually specific about their social circumstances. How do we design an individually tailored program to keep them healthy? That's happening around the country. People are doing it. So that's individualized medicine. The next is you move over in the care domain and the number one role for the care domain is to create value as I've defined it. We need to be explicit and expect it, measure it, report it, and be transparent. So that's the second big concept. And as it turns out, when we've studied this in some detail, it turns out that the organizations that are producing higher value care, better outcomes at lower overall spending, happen to all be integrated, coordinated systems. Integrated meaning they are working together, those are those galaxies I talked about. And coordinated means they're coordinating what happens around the patient. Rather than have the family member try to coordinate the care, the delivery system is engaged in helping that happen. So it turns out that those integrated coordinated systems, they didn't spring up with saying, oh, let's create better value care. They never thought about that years ago. They did it because they felt it was the right thing to do because it made sense. It turns out that they were right. It turns out that as a byproduct of providing integrated and coordinated care, you get better value. So those are three concepts that we need to be emphasizing and focusing as we move forward. The next concept is over, as we keep moving off to the, uh, your right-hand side, is that if we really want value, we have to fundamentally start figuring out how to pay for it. There are many examples on how to do this. I won't go into the detail now, but it basically requires providers, in no matter what scenario we take this, providers and provider organizations to begin to accept more of the risk. The groups that provide the highest value care in this country are groups that have accepted the whole risk. They have their own insurance company. Intermountain Clinic, Scott White Clinic, Kaiser, two great clinics in Wisconsin. Uh, the uh, Geisinger Clinic is moving in that direction. There are more and more places beginning to say, hey, if we really want to change this paradigm, we need to get to the first dollar. And then we can manage these patients any way we want. Just think if you can manage patients and you don't have to go through Medicare audits to prove that you did what you said you did. In the systems that have their own risk, they don't have to prove anything to anybody. They're managing patients, and, they're, and they get rewarded because they don't make money if they mess it up. Transplantation in the United States has been a, a product of which the U.S. is the top in the world, transplantation. It grew up on the Internet. All physicians' scores are there, all hospital scores, waiting times, organ system survivals, organ rates, rates of replacement, waiting times. It's all available on the Internet. Every patient's got it. And we contract for business in a huge bundled package. It could be 30 days long, could be three months, six months, year, year and a half. And that covers all drugs, all tests and everything. So if we screw up the transplant and the patient has to have a redo, we lose. Liver transplants used to be three or four weeks in the hospital. Today, the standard is a four day length of stay, no stop in the intensive care unit, up out of bed the day after surgery. Because when you do have the freedom to innovate within a black box of money, you can be quite innovative as providers. And to do this, in transplant for instance, the transplant centers, they don't have to be told that they need information technology and data and pull it all in or push it in on them. You don't have to push it anywhere. They pull it because they need it. it turns the whole paradigm around. The other category way to the right, this is number five, is the idea of getting insurance for everybody. I won't go into that detail now. That battle is being fought again. But after leading a, a, a health care policy center for several years, the number one concept that folded upward is that everybody should be able to choose from a select group, a, a large group of insurance products, which may be anywhere from 20 
In Washington, D.C., the federal employees plan has 157 insurance products. But the, the individuals may, may be free, where they can buy up and pay for more. It's a national exchange. No state mandates. There's no uh, preconditions. You, and there's no um, loss of insurance when you change jobs. You, you just keep it. It's quite an interesting option. That was the number one preference that came out of some of the work that we've done. But I'm not here to get into that detail. The final one I'd like to emphasize is the overall concept of the science of healthcare delivery, which basically says, how do we systematically look at the way we are providing care, relentlessly looking at the outcomes, trying new changes, this is, this is science, and how do we change this and move it forward and re-engineer the way we provide care? And those people who are putting in like electronic medical records and other things like this, if they don't systematically look at the way they change their practice to make use of the information that's available, if all they do is automate what they were doing before, they will not reap the potential reward of changing the way they're delivering the care. And IT becomes a support to make that happen, as many other things do, process engineering, etc. And this is, this is a significant issue that is now coming more to the fore through the National Academy of Engineering, the Institute of Medicine. A couple of schools have now introduced it. Mayo Clinic is expanding its medical school into Phoenix. And, it, and that there will be a required master's degree. All the students will have to take, uh, get a master's degree in the science of healthcare delivery, which involves social sciences, business, system engineering, financial modeling, all types of modeling concepts, so that when they leave medical school in the future, they will at least have a fundamental knowledge of what it takes to improve healthcare delivery. In the last 25 years, I've watched kids come out of medical school, and boy, do they know how to apply for an NIH grant to do basic research. Not only that, they've been brainwashed to the point that if they aren't able to do that, they're a failure, and they're just going to be a clinician. Huge problem in this country from our education system in that regard. I don't know when we began to train people in medical school to be competitive for research grants, when we should have been training them to be competitive to create new health care delivery and improve care for patients as we go forward. But that's another concept that's being worked on. So as we look at this, this I'll, I'll leave you with that diagram. That's basically the concepts I wanted to, to get across to you. And I hope that you'll see that this may or may not be where we end up, but it gives you an idea of saying, okay, now where are you going to fit in here? What's your potential role? What can you do to make this become useful? And there's a lot you can do. If I, can only, if I were only given one lever to pull, I would pull pay for value. If we could just get to the point that we're going to pay for value, I would submit the whole rest of the system will we'll start to self-organize, and then all of a sudden, physicians and hospitals that were wondering how they're going to make use of IT and electronic medical records will stop wondering. They're going to be knocking on your doors and say, we need it, and you're not giving it to us fast enough. We need the data collected, stored, retrieved, collated, analyzed, and we need decision support. Why? Because if we need to make decisions on how best to treat people and we're going to get paid for it, we need to change. So there's a unique opportunity here, I think, if we can just continue to try to get a few of these things right at the national level, I think the excitement that you're feeling about what is possible will not only be possible, but it will be necessary as you move forward. So thank you very much for listening and uh, have a wonderful couple of days. <laughs>